Good evening and welcome everybody to Skeptics in the Pub online. Uh, I hope everybody's well this evening. I know already from looking at the chat, we've got audience members from all over the world tuning into this event. So uh, I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, so Skeptics in the Pub online is uh, a group uh, of uh, skeptical organizations from across the country who ordinarily would be putting on events in uh, our own local towns and local, uh, local villages and uh, in our cities, uh, in pubs, in person with real human beings in front of us where we can actually... Uh, enjoy a pint uh, together in a community and unfortunately because of this whole COVID situation obviously we can't be doing that right now and so we've decided to band together to put together uh, this uh, this event for uh, the entire of the UK the entire UK uh, skeptical community working together and so we've been putting these events on every week since lockdown started and uh, hopefully it's been providing people an opportunity to keep connected to the skeptical audience uh, around the skeptical community of the UK and uh, a little skeptical fix in your uh, in your week. Um, as well as uh, talking about uh, the, 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 the talk that we'll have, the, the conversation we'll have later today, before uh, we get into that, I do want to just mention that uh, as it was after our last uh, talk, uh, because obviously everything that's going on at the moment, we decided rather than taking donations to uh, to go towards the, the costs of running our events and to keep things going, we thought instead we'd, uh, we'd make a donation uh, to UK Black Lives Matter uh, with the, the money that uh, that we raised uh, throughout the, the course of the evening. And I'm very, very happy to say that throughout the course of the evening, we raised £875.03. Uh, but on top of that, we had uh, matched donations from Hampshire Skeptics, Newcastle Skeptics, Manchester Skeptics, Merseyside Skeptics, Portsmouth of skeptics and a very generous viewer called Neil. Uh, so all together, we made a donation of two thousand six hundred and sixty-eight pounds ninety-three pence to UK Black Lives Matter, uh, which is about three thousand three hundred US dollars. So thank you so much to everybody who donated to that, and I think you'll all agree it's a very uh, worthwhile cause. Um, as we're as we're having the conversation with our with our speaker this evening, uh, feel free to join in the chat. You can see the chat there on Twitch uh, and keep the conversation going in there. And we'll be keeping an eye on uh, the questions that you're asking. But if you do want to specifically ask a question of our speaker, we also have a system uh, called Slido. If you go to sli.do forward slash nerdy, you can ask your questions there, and we'll be coming to those questions later in the evening. Um, the other thing you can do is if you like what we're doing and you want more of this to continue, you can make a small donation uh, at our PayPal link, which you can see linked on the screen. And our various moderators will pop that in the chat from time to time to, to show you uh, where you can uh, support us. Uh, and also, if you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you can subscribe to, to our, our Twitch channel for free and it will give us a small donation uh, on a monthly basis. So it's uh, your opportunity for uh, no cost to yourself to give us a little bit of money. So feel free to, to do that if you're uh, if you're interested. Um, so that brings us to our uh, our event this evening, which is a little bit different to our normal events. Usually we have a talk. Uh, tonight we're going to be uh, having a conversation uh, with our speaker, uh, with our guest. Our guest, Cara Santoria, is an award-winning journalist, science communicator, television personality, author, and podcaster. She's currently working towards a PhD in clinical psychology with a concentration in social justice and diversity. So please fill the chat with claps and appreciation <laughs> uh, for Cara this evening. Cara, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. This is so funny because we're not in a pub. I'm in my podcast studio. It looks like you're maybe <laughs> in your living room. And I'm drinking water. That's Cheers. it, you see, because uh, the time zone, you're, it would be surely socially inappropriate for you to be drinking at this time. We couldn't possibly be endorsing that, uh, you drinking at uh, 11 in the morning. But uh, we'd really appreciate you uh, you come along to join us. Um, how are you doing right now? How are, how are things? We're watching uh, in America with everything that's going on. How are, how are you keeping? Right. So I live in Los Angeles, right in the middle of the city, um, kind of on the east side, close to downtown in a little neighborhood called Eagle Rock. And it's an interesting experience being in, in some ways at Ground Zero. Obviously, Minneapolis is, is the main Ground Zero of these events. But of course, we've seen that there are Black Lives Matter marches across the globe in, in major cities everywhere. Uh, LA notoriously has had a lot of conflict with the LAPD. We have a long and kind of checkered history. Of course, uh, LA 92, the uh, Rodney King protests um, kind of come to mind for a lot of people. And, you know, it, it's been interesting to see because I was I didn't live here in 92. Um, also, I was only nine years old, but I lived in Texas <laughs> at the time. And so I don't think I was as kind of politically um, informed. I didn't really quite know what was going on. So it's definitely been interesting to see like the National Guard and tanks rolling through the streets. And like, mm. it, you know, it feels like an armed militia out there. It's really weird. Um, obviously, gun culture in the U.S. is completely different than gun culture in the U.K. So it, our norm 
storm is probably um, pretty intense uh, for for you guys across the yeah, pond, yeah. seeing what it's like, just how militarized our police is on a on a day to day basis. But definitely during um, a heightened protest situation, the amount of police brutality it's been um, it's been pretty intense. But I'm super proud of. Uh, of all of my fellow Angelinos and the um, just the turnout at these marches and how it uh, kind of elevated the conversation around um, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, mm-hmm. around not just police brutality, but about systemic racism, institutional racism, um, and uh, sort of how educated I think a lot of people who have been living with their white privilege for a long time and not really taking the time to do the anti-racist research and some of mm-hmm. the anti-racist work. I'm just really uh, excited to see the uh, kind of, I don't know, the raising of the consciousness of a lot of people around me. So. Yeah, it's it's an interesting time. It's obviously a very difficult time for a lot of people. Um, my hope is that it it leads to really progressive change, and and we are starting to see some uh, some real outcomes of these. Now we're into like week two of the protests. I think mm. um, you know, uh, well over seven days in. So uh, actually, wow, it's June eleventh already. Okay, <laughs> yeah. We are well into this because this really yeah, started yeah. to erupt just at the end of of, of May. So, um, and it's really cool to see that there are not just changes in some of the charges that are brought forth against some of these officers, but also, you know, in Minneapolis, there's a full, the city council has decided we're going to rethink what it means to do policing in general. And so that's really um, exciting outcome. I, I just hope it continues and people don't, don't forget when it's no longer quote unquote newsworthy. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. Yeah. And we're obviously seeing sort of uh, protests and uh, solidarity uh, offerings from uh, from all around the, the the world, and we're having that here in the UK. Um, we've actually got to talk next week with Angela Sini talking about the return of race signs, which is obviously super relevant uh, right, right now, and we're kind of really really excited about uh, about that. Um, but as well as all this going on, you've also previous to that, we've also got the the, the coronavirus. Uh, uh, yeah crisis uh, happening and obviously you've got quite a, a portfolio career quite a, a, an eclectic career how has that been affecting your your day jobs and your many different day jobs how are you finding that well so I mean I'm I, I am in a really privileged position so I can't really complain but I will say that there, I'm, there's some nervousness that's starting to creep in <laughs> Mostly because, you know, a lot of what I do already, I do from home. So podcasting, which is, um, I I wouldn't say a big source of my income, but it's what I would consider like my safety net income between Talk Nerdy and The Skeptic's Guide. That sort of like pays my mortgage, um, Mm -hmm. which is amazing. I mean, a lot of podcasters aren't even lucky enough to say that, but it definitely is not quite enough uh, because I live in LA, which is, you know, anybody who's listening from uh, London, at least they're like, yeah, I know what that's like. (laughs) Um, It's not cheap. Um, And so that's... uh, that hasn't really changed. Also, I'm lucky that my PhD program is mostly online. It's the only APA, which is the American Psychological Association, which is our um, governing body for psychologists in the U.S. It's the only APA accredited PA that is um, what we call like a, a distributed model. So we do a lot of in-person stuff, but the bulk of it is actually done via distance learning. Um, so that really hasn't changed much either. The biggest things are uh, seeing clients. So mm-hmm. I was working in a group home setting, um, which is, uh, I don't know if you guys have group homes in the UK, but it's its sort of an extension of the foster care system. So okay. it's where a lot of these, uh, I was working with teenage girls, but it's where a lot of kids might live who haven't yet been placed with a foster family. Um, and so it's kind of a step in between what we might consider institutional care, which would be like a multi-bed situation. So these group homes are, are just converted houses. So like six girls to a house. So I was working there providing therapy um, for some of the girls that were in these transitional parts of their lives. Um, And we had to switch to a a teletherapy model. And Mm. I just didn't really feel like it was as effective. I've I've since closed out that therapy site. And I really can't start a new one until things change because it's very difficult to start establishing rapport and really to do training um, because I'm not a licensed therapist yet, right? I'm still getting all of my hours on my PhD Mm. Um, and so I have to do this under another psychologist license and it's just complicated because you can't do it in person right now. And really there's so much to be said about the rapport that you develop, you know, in the space. Like we talk off a lot about holding space and we talk about, you know, kind of the emotional tone of the room. And when you're not even in the same room, that's 
that's really difficult. And then, of course, um, I, I am working on a television show. It's called Brain Games. It was reimagined last season for um, for National Geographic here in the U.S. And also now it's on Disney Plus um, because Disney and Nat Geo, Disney now owns Nat Geo. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we we filmed all that. We aired it. It was all great. And we were set to film this summer. And it's been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. So that's a really tough thing because that's like the bulk of my income. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working like, on that right now. With all these different uh, these different projects, different strands, has it was it always your intention to have such a, an eclectic career, like a portfolio career? Or how did you end up applying yourself to, to so many different things at once, really? Right. I don't know if I ever had an intention. I think that was always my problem. So when I think back to my goals early on, you know, when I was first working on, let's say, my my bachelor's degree in Texas, where I grew up, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I started in vocal jazz performance because I was a singer all through high school and I was doing Mm. a lot of gigging and like doing semi-professional singing. So that's what I was studying. But I realized as soon as it became academic, it was taking a lot of the fun out of it. And I didn't I Ultimately, if I'm going to be 100% honest, I got an undergrad in psychology because it seemed easy. <laughs> it was like <laughs> it was one of those degrees that kind of like didn't require a lot of math or science and I, and I, I mean, really I've got an English t- literature degree, so I am not go. in any way. <laughs> 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 And at the time, I didn't know. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew that I was in college and I didn't like my major and I needed to pick a new uh, path pretty quickly. So I studied psychology. Ultimately, during the course of my degree, I found my legs. I found some really great advisors. I got really interested in neuropsychology and started doing research. I did a bachelor's thesis and ended up getting a, a bachelor of science degree as opposed to a bachelor of the arts degrees, which mm-hmm. some schools, I don't know. It's I don't know if the education system really comports across the pond, but um I ended up basically doing a version of my degree that was much more research oriented. Um, And then still didn't know what I wanted to do. Worked for about a year, you know, took some time off and then decided, I feel like I don't know enough about the brain from kind of a biological perspective. So I decided Mm -hmm. to go back to school to get a master's degree and I switched departments. So I was still at my, at my university, uh, the, the university of North Texas, which is, you know, 45 minutes from where I grew up because again, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and I, I studied neurobiology for my master's degree, did some research, still didn't know what I wanted to do, still took another year off to teach and make money, and then ultimately moved to New York to start a PhD program because it seemed like the next logical step. Um, didn't really, like New York was a tough thing for me. It was like transitioning from, you know, the sunny countryside in yeah, Texas, yeah. the South where even though I think that um, politically and ideologically, I was at odds with a lot of people, but in terms of the kind of culture, like Texas is just a very warm, polite, neighborly, I mean, you don't want to get below the surface with many of these people, but, <laughs> you know, at least in terms of... I'm sure know, if you've got any viewers from Texas, I'm sure you're yeah. all lovely, you're in the right place, so... Uh. Totally, if you're listening to, if you're here on a Skeptics in the Puck, like, you're my people. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was it was definitely tough growing up in a super conservative, like, Mormon family, and, you know, the Bible Belt, all that good stuff. There's yeah, a lot of yeah. entrenched racism in the South. Um, so moving to New York, I was, like, really excited. But what I don't think I realized was that the culture shock of kind of how fast it is there, how dark the city is, how um, kind of in many ways cold the city is. Somebody who is struggling with mental illness um, really didn't have a good therapist. I wasn't taking meds for depression at the time, and I was a bit rudderless. So I did a year towards a PhD, but ultimately I ended up leaving, which was one of the hardest decisions I had uh, made. I had visited LA and really fallen in love with the city. The sun, I think, was very healthy for me from a mental health perspective. Um, The pace worked for me. And uh, it just seemed like there was some interesting opportunity. So my intention at that time, this would have been like 2008, I think, was always to come to L.A., establish residency, and then reapply to a new Ph.D. program. Yeah, yeah. But weirdly, I started getting some opportunities to be like an expert guest on like local news shows and, you know, talk about science um, because I was a scientist. I was a working scientist at the time um, and talk about kind of what was new in the world of science. I think a lot of my teaching experience helped me do that a little bit more comfortably. Mm. And, you know, when I first got the offers, I was like, why me? This is weird. Nobody's going to want me for this. And it also doesn't pay, by the way, being an expert guest. So it wasn't really 
thought of as a career. It was just like, oh, this seems fun while I'm trying to figure out and establish my roots. Um, but it ultimately slowly, weirdly turned into uh, an actual career uh, for me. And I, I never expected it to, but it, it started to pay pretty well. Um, hmm, who would have thought television pays better than <laughs> teaching? Um, so it was a hard thing to kind of walk away from. And, but deep, deep in my heart, I think I always knew that, uh, I wasn't done with academia and I was going to go back. And, and I basically made the decision to go back to school a couple of years ago. Now I'm a third year PhD student. Um, I made the decision when I was finally in a financial position, because of course, financial considerations in the U S are also very different than the UK because we don't yeah, have yeah. many universal social systems. Right. So we have to pay for our own health care. Uh, a lot of our education we have to pay for out of pocket. And I decided I will not take out another student loan. I'm going to wait until I'm in a financial position where I'm lucky enough. I have that kind of privilege to be able to pay for school out of pocket and, you know, obviously have, uh, paid off all of the debt leading up to that. And and that's why it took until I was like in my mid 30s to go back to school. <laughs> but I'm glad that I did it that way because now I don't feel trapped mm. or like really under the thumb of um, a government loan program or even of my university. You know, I can make decisions that are best for me because I have a little bit more um, not just freedom, but I think a little bit more control over my own destiny now. Um, it's it's pretty amazing how much these financial obligations can really take that yeah, that control yeah. away from somebody and have you know really devastating effects on the, on their life. And, and that control on your, on your destiny, I think, is kind of a, an interesting thing to pick on, because one of the things I was going to ask was, um, because you're quite uh, eclectic in the portfolio of things that you're uh, you're working on, how do you choose what to get involved in when you're presumably quite stretched on time? How do you balance what sounds important, what sounds fun, what pays the bills, what has a long term benefit? How do you navigate that? So it's funny, you know, I've I've kind of taught um, a lot of seminars and things like that on science communication. And I also co-founded and co-ran for about five years, a like adult sleepaway camp called Psycom <laughs> Camp, which was so much fun for, for uh, early career all the way to establish science communicators in every different field, uh, all the way from a freelancer to somebody who's maybe a PIO for a university or something. Mm. Um, and we always would do a session and I actually have one later today cause we invited, uh, kind of our Psycom campers from the past to do a zoom meeting, um, called the freelancers support group, uh, <laughs> sort of like therapy for freelancers. And of course, with all the, you know, uh, weirdness of COVID and the uh, pressures that people are feeling, we decided it was a good idea to, mm. to have another freelancer support group. And one of the things that we talked about in the fr freelancer support group, and I can't remember if it was Ed Yong or Liz Neely who first introduced these ideas to, to me and some of my colleagues. But we talk about this concept called the three P's, um, profit, passion, and prestige. And okay. one of the things as a freelancer that a lot of people struggle with is making those decisions. What is... Um, What's a good decision for me and my career where I'm not being taken advantage of? Because it's actually very easy to be taken advantage of in this field, especially, you know, I'm lucky I have an agent who negotiates my deals for me. Um, n very few people have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And especially women, especially uh, people of color, we historically find ourselves in a, in a not great position when it comes to negotiations um, and kind of being very apologetic and thanking people for opportunities that Honestly, they should never have asked us to do in the first place for free. Yeah, yeah. It's a tough thing, right? So uh, the three P's, passion, payment, and prestige, the rule of thumb that we often uh, promote is never accept something unless it has two of the three. Okay. You would never want just one. So it might pay really well and be something you you are really excited about, but not no many not many people are going to see it. That's okay. Or maybe it's something that'll really elevate your career, and it's a passion project, but you're not going to make much money. That's okay too. Or maybe you know it's something that a lot of people are see will see, and it'll be good for your career. It's not really your area of interest. You don't care about it much, but the paycheck is good enough. That's okay. But when you're really 
accepting something just for the payment, it's often the case that you are going to feel guilty about some of the um, trade-offs that you had to make if, if there's mm. no passion and there's no prestige. If you're accepting something just for passion, I think it's pretty easy to get taken advantage of. And I would say that's definitely the case for just prestige, because this is a common thing for science writers, where it's like, oh, but you'll get exposure. You know what? <laughs> Through your exposure, pay me what I'm worth. Um, yeah, that's yeah. a hard lesson for a lot of uh, freelancers to learn. And, and I, su uh, I suspect that's even more so for uh, people from communities where they're not the faces that you typically see in those places where um, exposure might be something that some someone tries to essentially palm them off with, whereas yeah. uh, someone who's a bit more uh, from a from a you know a community where we're more used to seeing those people in that play in the, that position will have the the confidence to say actually I I deserve to be there because I see people like me here all the time, um, right? Which is to ask what you're worth. Absolutely. And when it comes to figuring out what you're worth, I mean, one thing that I promote a lot within my community is actually being pretty transparent and open about things like day rates and fees. I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with that, but I think this is the only way that we can expose gender gaps and ethnicity gaps in payment is to be really um, transparent about that. But the advice that I often give individuals when they're like, I have no idea how much to charge is I always say, okay, think about how much you actually deserve to make. Like, what would you want to make for that job? Now double it. That's what you should ask. <laughs> Don't ask for what you think you deserve because it's always going to be lower mm. than what you actually deserve. And you're never going to, you're always going to start from a position of weakness in your negotiations because you're probably not going to get exactly what you ask for. So you always want to start well above what you think you'd be willing to settle for. So yeah, think what you're worth and double it. That's going to be the best uh, opening part <laughs> of your negotiation. <laughs> Well, it's, it's great career advice that I'm sure our, uh, our audience will uh, be taken on board. Um, but if I could come to the science communication work that you that you do, one of the things that really strikes me about uh, so much of the stuff that I've seen you do is, is how um, approachable you can make it. So what, what do you think are the, the keys to making science and particularly quite um, intricate ideas, quite complicated ideas, quite challenging ideas, making those approachable and accessible to an audience who maybe isn't fully accustomed to some of the terminology, the language and, and the, the way those ideas are sort of put together? Right. I mean, I think that there's a lot of, of different things we could talk about here. I think one of them is authenticity, being really true to yourself and true to your voice. And, you know, a lot. Uh, we live in a modern era of social media and self-produced content. And so one of the first things that people will see right through is if you're not being true to your own voice. You're trying to act like somebody else or or give a message that you don't yourself believe in. People are going to be like, I don't buy it. This feels phony, right? So you're never going to be effective. So if, you know, be you. And I think that is a big part of it, right? You're going to always be more approachable if you're just a real person with yeah, yeah. humanity and humility. I think another um, aspect of that, though, really I give a lot of credit to my training in the mental health field. I think that as I have been evolving in my academic journey and also in my kind of uh, search for my own self-identity, which is, you know, I think a never-ending lifelong process, um, a, a lot of the, I've gotten better at this. I think early on, I wasn't as good at being sensitive to mm -hmm. the individuals with whom I'm speaking. Um, and, and, you know, giving credit where credit is due. I think one of the things that I often, I have like a top five or top 10 list when I give talks about Psycom, uh, you know, uh, these are the main rules you need to know. And one of the ones that seems to resonate with a lot of people is um, never under underestimate the intelligence of your audience, but always underestimate their vocabulary, right? Okay. Like in any specific field, there's going to be jargon the same way that when my plumber comes to my house to fix my toilet or an electrician or HVAC guy, as we call it here, comes to fix my air conditioning unit. He knows all these turns of phrase and he uses all these words. And I'm like, you're a genius. I don't understand <laughs> anything you're saying. And I think a lot of people have that feeling towards science as well. But really, it's just because we have a shorthand in certain fields, which makes it easier to communicate with each other. Um, obviously, the rest of the community doesn't have that shorthand. So the idea here is explain the language, use circumlocute, use more words than you would usually mm. use. That's fine. But the conceptual stuff, I think a lot of people within the sciences, they conflate those two things. So they think, oh, because the general audience doesn't understand the language, they must never be able to understand these concepts. And it's like, yeah, screw yeah. you, man, of course they can. <laughs> this isn't that hard. So I always kind of have a benefit of the doubt. And it's hard upstream here in the US, especially in the TV landscape, because I can't tell you how many producers I've worked with 
who are like, dumb it down. There's no way yeah, you can say yeah. that on air. Nobody's going to understand that. And it's like a constant education. And guys, you're always going to be playing to the lowest common denominator if you give your audience zero credit. Mm. Um, so I think that's a culture shift that needs to change. I think in the UK, you guys have always done better. I think Canada, we see a similar thing. But like the American, Americanification of the Western world is a real phenomenon. And mm. I think you've probably even seen a decline um, in some of the uh, programming that is coming out of like, you know, these BBC channels because they're becoming more kind of Americanized. And that's uh, really problematic. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. No bueno. Um, so yeah, that's a big part of, of, I think, being able to speak the language, being able to, you know, always give credit where credit, give your audience a little credit. Um, and, and then really it's the psychology, you know, I think the training in therapy, one of the things you do when you work as a therapist, especially somebody who's existentially and humanistically oriented like I am, is you have these these tenets in the room that are really important, which are like unconditional positive regard, right? My client is my client and I care about them deeply, um, uh, a non-judgmental stance. Now, this is very difficult when you're working with, let's say, somebody who is in the criminal justice system, who's a, mm. a, an offender and uh, maybe has been, um, uh, you know, charged with a sex crime. Uh, you know, uh, maybe they've been charged with rape of a minor and now you're going to be doing therapy with them. And people say, well, how could you possibly have unconditional positive regard or, or, you know, really positive non-judgmental stance with them. And it's, you know, you have to do a lot of soul searching to, mm. to be able to do that. I struggle with this, um, not so much with offenders. I struggle with it more, uh, when I'm working with clients who themselves have not had a real awakening about their own, maybe bigotry yeah, or their own, yeah racism is how do I then approach them with this really open stance when I like how do I be tolerant of their intolerance um and there's a lot of soul searching that comes from that but those lessons obviously translate to science communication right mm -hmm. how do you reach somebody when their worldview is different when they have you know this kind of construct this whole conversation about constructivism and postmodern thought in skepticism um that's often poo-pooed like ugh, people don't create their own reality science is science and what's real is real yeah and, and yeah it's kind of like that's a great notion and i'm really you know that's great if you believe that sort of from an academic scholastic perspective but in the real world for all intents and purposes what people believe is constructed yeah, yeah. Enough, <laughs> like, I mean, I, I spend a, a lot of time talking to people who uh, believe in all manner of incredibly bizarre things, and and that's kind of one of the the experiences that I have I have as well is that um, we can underestimate uh, and uh, make assumptions about what people we disagree with think uh, in order in, in some ways to um, comfort ourselves. You know, these people believe in something terrible; they must be terrible people because that's a much more comfortable right. thing to yeah, to believe like than. That fundamental attribution error for sure that goes in line with that like they do bad things they're bad people i yeah. do a bad thing i just made a mistake <laughs> yeah yeah and and, yeah. and actually what i find the more that i that i engage with people who promote even some very very dangerous ideas i spoke to a guy just the other just the other week who uh believed that uh, the aids virus didn't exist and he was treating right. aids patients and he believed it was just stress and he talked me through the, the various people he's uh he's treating it's very easy to say well he's treating these people he must be evil because that's quite right. comforting when actually he's someone who's incredibly well-meaning but hugely damaging and i think the skeptics in particular i think that's a, a useful lesson for us to have because you actually have more of an, an opportunity to change things if you understand how they really are rather than you're fighting against the straw man of everybody who disagrees with me and is doing damage must be an evil con man Bad quack evil. all this kind of thing right and i don't even believe in the concept of evil right because not mm, only yeah. am i a skeptic but i'm also an atheist and i'm also somebody who studies social justice and i really like don't have a conception of like pure evil. Like I don't think people are possessed by the devil. I don't think that there's like a core like badness. I really mm -hmm. think that most people who do very bad things do so out of fear or desperation. And so when we can really start to understand those motivations and I'm really talking bad things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like murder and genocide and like some like real atrocities. I think that we actually do ourselves a disservice when we just go, Oh, well that person was just evil. But if we really start to understand the psychology, of an individual who is desperate for, um, you know, who has like a narcissistic kind of uh, motivation or the psychology of a person who has experienced such uh, 
difficult trauma during childhood development leading to some of these kinds of behaviors. That's really the only way we're ever going to be able to approach these these big societal problems to just minimize them and say, oh, well, that person's evil. We should just lock them up. Like that doesn't solve anything ultimately. And it doesn't help. It's not moving mm. any sort of needle forward in a progressive way. You know, as, as you were kind of saying what you were saying, I was reminded of a, a meme that I uh, retweeted or reposted on Instagram it, within these last weeks um, uh, when I was kind of making an effort to only amplify black voices and to have conversations only around um, around these Black Lives Matter issues. And it's unsigned, which breaks my heart. So I'm hoping that people listening, if you've come across this, maybe you can tell me who wrote this so we can give a shout out to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's something that I feel like every skeptic needs to hear. When I first, it resonated so deeply with me. I think... Um, Lori Winkless, who's a New Zealand science writer, shared it, and I picked it up from her and shared it. But um, anyway, so here we go. Bear with me. When you debate a person about something that affects them more than it affects you, remember that it will take a much greater emotional toll on them than on you. For you, it may feel like an academic exercise. For them, it feels like revealing their pain only to have you dismiss their experience and sometimes their humanity. The fact that you might remain more calm under these circumstances is a consequence of your privilege, not increased objectivity on your part. Stay humble. Mm. This is something I think so many skeptics struggle with. This idea that like, no, I can be calm and no, I can talk about just the facts. So somehow I am a better skeptic or I'm a better debater or I'm a more advanced. I'm sorry, but you cannot remove emotion from the equation. I know that seems to be the weird skeptical goal. Like, let's just not have emotion <laughs> in the conversation. I think that that's a bad way to frame it. I think that that takes suppositions from the start that are simply impossible because we're human beings. Yes, you can work towards being unbiased and yes you can mm. work towards you know all of these improvements in in these kind of cognitive flaws but the way that you do that is not to pretend they don't exist the way that you do that is to grapple with them in a deep way and to find them in yourself and understand them and approach them with curiosity approach them with kindness and work towards um you know making peace with the fact that these are a part of the conversation. But so often I find that skeptics uh, want to pride themselves on not being biased or yeah, on, yeah. you know, on being dispassionate and objective, um, which is all nice and good on paper. But in practice, what that often can backfire into and amount to is being cruel and being mm. un unfeeling and uh, lacking, I think, uh, you know, basic empathy. And that's a big problem with our movement and it's something I, I, I hope that we can see um, uh, improvement on. Yeah, I, I would agree and I think it's a, it's a problem for a, for a, a number of different reasons, one of which being uh, if what you're trying to do is actually understand something rather than win the argument, rather than to right. you know, uh, destroy someone in the debate with logic and reason. You know, logic and reason aren't weapons to destroy people with, they're tools to understand <laughs> ideas. Um, and, and so if you are saying, well, I'm, uh, I'm uh, an ultimate rational actor and any amount of emotion shown by someone who disagrees with me is proof that I, that I won the, the argument, you're not actually at that point trying to get to truth what you're trying to get is is the w on your side um, right, which i think is, and, and really that's genuine. bullying more than yeah, anything yeah. right that's that's like your goal is to bully that person into breaking down so that then you can what lord over them that you didn't it's, yeah. it's a strange approach and, and it's almost to, to paraphrase uh, uh an old saying you know always tr tr follow people who strive for objectivity but question anyone who claims they've got it essentially exactly. is that we have oh. objectivity we all we can do is recognize what our uh, and try and accommodate the biases that we have and acknowledge them um but i think also when it comes to that that facts don't care about your feelings crowd i think the other thing it fundamentally misses is in many cases feelings don't care about your facts in that right. so many people including ourselves everybody is driven by the feelings that they have and and their, their decisions are made on their instinct and gut and, and often backed up by the facts and if you want to change someone's mind and want to try and pull people towards a more questioning point of view a more a more logical or skeptical point of view the way you do that is to understand their feelings understand the the various actions and various uh, factors that uh, that uh, that uh, impact upon them, and then try and to engage with them at that level, rather than saying, "Here's the facts, and if you don't like it, that's your own fault." So, well, you'll never change anyone's mind that way. You'll never help oh. anything that way. 
And the truth is, I do think that there's almost a, the, I, I reject the entire premise of facts versus feelings. I think there's a logical fallacy of a false dichotomy in there, because the truth of the matter is, our cognitions and our emotions, well, first of all, these are constructs, right? These are just labels that we've described to try and have a taxonomy, to try and make sense of, of our psychological world. But the truth of the matter is that they they exist intertwined with one another. You can't like separate out logic on this side of your brain and emotion on that side of your mm-hmm. brain. That's not how neuroscience works, right? You're... you're Thoughts are tinged with emotion and your emotions have all sorts of cognitive themes running through them. And really, they're two sides of the same coin. And I think a lot of people want to, I don't know, describe these kinds of concepts as if, first of all, they're not constructs, but they are, you know, somehow like things that exist beyond our labels or Mm. things that exist and that we've been able to grapple with in a way that in the same way that like my computer exists or like this table exists, like my love is not like this table, right? Or my (laughs) passion or my confusion or my guilt or my shame or any of those things. And, you know, I, I think that's again, something that I have been able to make sense of the more that I dig deep into the relationship between neuroscience and psychology, it's very easy to stay on one or the other side of the aisle, right? Mm. It's very easy to throw yourself fully into a psychological worldview that ignores biology. And I think that that can be pretty dangerous, but it's also very easy to throw yourself into a biological way of thinking about the mind and the brain and behavior that just fully ignores some of these central psychological concepts. And when you do that, I think ultimately you end up removing a lot of humanity from the equation and Mm. oversimplifying the way that all of this stuff works. And I think as skeptics, one of the best things that we can do when it comes to kind of self-education it's, it's less about reading all the books about Bigfoot, even though that could be important. It's less about reading all the books about logical fallacies, although that could be important. important. And it's more about, I think, kind of studying s- basic philosophy. And mm-hmm. yes, logic is a part of that conversation, but so is epistemology, so is phenomenology, so is existentialism. And the more that you read some of these basic philosophical uh, ideas, the more you see that those same concepts and those same arguments and those same deep uh, conflicts, they're not new. Mm, mm. They've been grappled with for hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. And when you see how other people have historically grappled with them, it can really help inform your understanding of the world. Yeah, I'd agree. And do you think um, there's there's, uh, anything in the the idea that as as skeptics, we've been very... um, conditioned over the the time of the sort of the current skeptical movement to see skepticism as science like the two things are 100 percent overlapping uh, that uh, a skeptical topic has to be science give me the data or or, or it's nothing uh, and so we we've seen even parts of our own community denigrating things like the study of history the study of philosophy the study of communications mm-hmm. i remember i was doing a science conference uh here in liverpool for a for a, a group and um i was asked the question about uh how do we uh, in, in a world where people can't tell what's true and what's not true um should there be something on the syllabus that teaches people uh, the methods of thinking how to construct arguments how to understand things and i said well yes there should and there was it was called philosophy but a lot of scientists <laughs> largely said uh, it's only good for flipping burgers and uh, we, we sort of didn't incorporate that into our movement um what what do you what do you make of that really I think it's true. And I think it's funny. One of the things that I've been focusing on lately, I don't know, it's been in my mind. The way that I think is obviously the way that a lot of people think, but it's really salient for me in that I tend to kind of connect things and uh, make sense of the world in a way where I'm constantly taking in new information and attaching it to old information, Mm. right? Um, And so because of that, I see parallels sometimes where they probably don't exist. But um, one of the things that I've been noticing lately with engagement in social media is that I very easily fall victim to getting sea lioned. Do you know this concept (laughs) of sea lioning? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I'm sure lots of our audience might not know, so uh, feel free to, uh, to, to define it. 
Right. So it's based on a cartoon. And in the cartoon, somebody says, like, I don't even remember. I'm paraphrasing and I'm probably butchering it. But they're like, marine mammals are fine. But I, those sea lions, not a fan. And then like a sea lion pops up and he's like, please provide evidence as to why you believe sea lions. And he just keeps bothering them. Like they're trying to go to bed at night. They're trying to. And he's like, well, it's okay. We'll pick this up later. (laughs) And so kind of the definition of sea lioning is that online you'll have, it's like a type of trolling where an individual will um, just keep in a very polite way so damn it you get caught in their net so easily like, it <laughs> seems like they're operating on good faith but they just keep asking for evidence and no matter what evidence you provide it seems to not be enough and they'll mm-hmm. sometimes move the goalposts and there's some they'll sometimes make straw man arguments and they'll make all sorts of logical fallacies in their pursuit where it's like they're just never satisfied and they keep asking for evidence which a lot of people go oh but that's a great way to be skeptical no this is really a means of trolling and the sad thing is because i'm a skeptical thinker i think i get i fall victim to this quite often. And Mm. I do see parallels between the kind of sea lioning approach and exactly what you're talking about, this need or this obsession to make everything into a logical positivism argument, right? That it's all about the evidence. Mm. And that if you can't approach something scientifically, you you shouldn't be approaching it at all, or it's not relevant. And what that first of all, shows is a very superficial understanding of the role of science as um, an epistemology. I think it also shows a really superficial understanding of what the science method is and isn't capable of. I think we frame in our minds that science is a double-blind placebo-controlled study. Right, yeah, yeah. But I'm sorry, you can't apply that to most problems, (laughs) There's a, it's like a pretty narrow, it's like medicine. <laughs> That's when mm-hmm. we use double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Even in a lot of psychological experiments, it doesn't work because there's certain things that can't be blinded and there's certain things that aren't ethical to do that with. Um, and for some reason, that has become the gold standard for how we think. Um, I think sometimes you see the same kinds of fallacies coming into play when we talk about things like laws of nature versus theories versus hypotheses. Like we want everything to be Newtonian physics and it's just not. And even Newtonian physics we know doesn't really (laughs) hold in, in, you know, uh, certain situations like in, in relativity models. And so that's why I think it's important that we review these conversations about epistemology, right? Epistemology is the field of philosophy that's, that um, grapples with the idea of how we know what we know, what is knowing. Um, and science is just one epistemology. And when it works, it's amazing because it's self-correcting usually. And because, I mean, it's done by people. So, yeah, but in the yeah. grand <laughs> scheme of things, sure, if you give long enough, it can be self-correcting. Um, and because it has provided for what a lot of people might call progress, which I have a hard time time with that term in this situation, but let's say improved or increased technological advancements Mm -hmm. um, more rapidly than almost any other way of thinking, of course. And so if you're somebody who's really interested in um, keeping tabs on new medical breakthroughs and, uh, you know, what we understand about the cosmos, the things that we care about if we're science communicators, right? The things that are interesting to us, we start to see the world through that lens. And I think that that's dangerous. I think seeing the world through a skeptical lens is important and seeing the world, even through a scientific lens is important in so far as it's applicable. Mm. But the problem is we then start to really try to fit square pegs into round. And this is probably so uncomfortable for so many skeptics. No, I, I, hear I me think saying, it's, uh, they're like, she's not a real skeptic. Um, no, I but, think it's very much in keeping with the, the kind of thing that we we do, or that we see, I think quite a lot in, in part in the in the UK skeptic community. Mm. Cause I think there's, there's an issue perhaps that um, some people come to skepticism and, and they, they train themselves to see themselves as I am a scientific thinker. I'm a skeptical thinker. You know, I'm a skeptic now, give me something to be right about. Yeah. Uh, essentially in that kind of way and so they, they're so used to being right about topics like whether psychics are real or whether homeopathy works that they can people can if they're not careful train themselves to assume that they're right about things and, and so when topics come up that go against what they feel they look instead to defend the position rather than follow like an actual critical thinking a self-critical thinking and, and try to examine their own biases and uh, and, and uh, what they want to be true and sort of take that into account and it can lead them to some pretty uh, erroneous positions to some pretty uh, blind alleys and dead ends and all sorts of, uh, of bad thinking because they've trained themselves to assume that they're, they're right <laughs> so often. All the time, right. And, and I mean, it really lends itself to when I read this um, 
this little passage to the SGU guys, the Skeptics Guide guys, um, the other day. Be- I think it wasn't on air. I think it was before we started recording. And Steve made such a, an astute point, as he often does, where he was like, right, it's easy to be dispassionate about something that doesn't affect you. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, it's if you're one of these people who's arguing against some of the concepts that are being put forth in Black Lives Matter, you need to check your privilege. And one of the things that he pointed out was like, let's see how well you handle it when we start to argue what, uh, against one of your sacred cows, mm. right? Or when we start, and the truth is, I know in skepticism, it's all about losing every s- sacred cow. And like, but I think sometimes what we forget, and we talked about this, I actually talked about this with Angela uh, Saini when we interviewed her for the SGU, is that there's a disconnect, a real practical disconnect between what we aspire to do in science and as skeptics and what we are capable of doing in science and and, in skepticism. And I think sometimes we conflate the two. And so we pride ourselves on our aspirational nature when our true nature falls short of that. And that's Mm. because we're human beings and that's okay. So instead of just constantly pretending like that's not the case and like science actually does exactly what it's set out to do and there are no biases and human beings are all droids who never make mistakes, maybe what we should be doing is grappling with the fact that we are human and this is where the error comes in and this is how we can improve. Um, Because really, at at its most fundamental base, that's what skepticism is, right? Mm -hmm. It's the disconnect between the practical and the aspirational and operating within that space and determining what we can do within that space is where the good work is actually done. Yeah, yeah. And and I think so many of that, that idea of getting rid of sacred cows, I think it's something that because people, people, I think, can very easily forget that we're prone to uh, having sacred cows. It's kind of in our in our sort of natural makeup yeah. to want to not necessarily idolize something, but want to look up to something to, to be able to uh, gather around uh, a totem to say we're all on the same team here. And I think we can do such work in getting rid of the sacred cows in, as skeptics, getting rid of the idea of ghosts and psychics and homeopathy and all that stuff. And as atheists, getting rid of the sacred cows in religion. And if we're not careful and, and not understanding that as an ongoing process we can then just end up elevating other people to the the pedestal of sacred cow themselves and i think it happens all the time right yeah, and, you and have i think these... in skepticism and atheism in the uk it feels like it's quite grassroots but in the us it seems like it's quite a bit more organization driven sometimes even personality driven and that has been prone and will continue to be prone to running into trouble when those organizations or, or people turn out to be hugely problematic uh, somewhere down the line Oh, for sure. I mean, we've seen it. We, I mean, and we can point to it, right? We can say uh, with m- the Michael Shermers and the Richard Dawkins and the Lawrence Krauses of the world mm. that when people have deified these individuals and kind of said, "Oh, this is the this is what it means to be a skeptic," and then made them into their idols, and then of course um, learned things about not just their personal lives or their moral stances about the world, but even about their science. Mm. Um, and, and really had to grapple with what that feels like. And, and I think even beyond that, this idea of like always wanting to remove our sacred cows again, aspirationally, that's great. And I do promote it, but ultimately when you get down, and this is, I think something that the more you study kind of like existential psychology and philosophy, the more that you start to really have to grapple with is there is no there, there, like the more you deconstruct, the more you realize that you have to have some sort of worldview to hold on to, Mm. lest you become fully depersonalized. So yes, I can, like you said, uh, have an awakening about the fact that homeopathy is not real or have an awakening about the fact that there's no such thing as ghosts or even that there's no such thing as God. But what happens when you have an awakening about the fact that, you know, uh, your parents are fallible and that the the society that you live in is fundamentally broken or fundamentally mm. damaged or or actually fundamentally dark and twisted in a in a deeply unethical way. What or, happens or fundamentally unfair in your favor, which is an incredibly exactly. hard thing to accept. Exactly. And I mean, even beyond that, we could do thought experiments about what would happen if somebody came and and you realized one day that there actually is a God or that there is a multiverse or that we are living in a simulation. You know, these things that are not probable, but they're possible. And how 
depersonalized, how crushing to your worldview that would be. And it's very easy to sit here and go, well, then I would just adjust. (laughs) But no, you would have an existential crisis and everything would fall apart. And we have to remember that that is the exact same thing we're talking about when we talk about communicating with somebody whose entire worldview is based on um, a belief in a, in a higher power or is Mm. based on, uh, conspiratorial thinking or even is based on a, a racial bias that is deeply entrenched. You know, you can't just shame them into changing their minds because it's yeah. not about changing their minds. It threatens their very existence and their very identity. Yeah, that's that's something I was going to uh, mention because I've been involved in um, doing tests of people who believe that they have psychic powers. And, and universally, when we found out by conducting the, the, the tests and it turns out they didn't show themselves to have psychic powers under those circumstances. Um, what I always find fascinating is you can give them the evidence of how they did. And, and beforehand, you say, how, how do you feel that like you did? Oh, it was fantastic. Oh, it was absolutely brilliant. There was no problems at all. Well, here's yeah. how it actually went. Well, actually, that test was a little bit tricky. And I know that the, the spirits like to play games at this point. And, and I, I didn't feel quite as good, but I didn't want to let you down. And I think part of that, when I, when I talk to people about this, and I give talks about uh, testing psychics, I can understand that. Because for the, the lady that I was talking about in that, uh, in that case, if, you asked, if, if anybody asked her, tell me something about you, she'd say, I'm psychic. It was that mm-hmm. definitional to who she is. And, and uh, an afternoon spent with uh, a stranger isn't going to change something so core about her identity. It's going to be much easier to find ways of explaining it because it's so fundamental to how she sees herself. And it takes a lot to ever be able to, ever be able to get to a point where you can overcome that, if indeed you ever can. The most you can do is start to nudge people in the right direction and hope that they're receptive enough because they, they trust the rapport that you have or they trust you as a positive actor. And, and you slowly can move people to a position but you can't shock them out of it because it's when it's all definitional to who they are and some of this stuff does require generational change like it's just not going to happen on the time scale that you know we're but it's like maybe a slightly more open mind maybe a little tiny nudge the Mm. things that you might think are thankless or you might feel like are what is even the point like those are the kinds of things because now when they raise their children they might be raising their children to be slightly more open and creating more you know physical people who then have more potential to have a skeptical worldview you know sometimes these kinds of things um as you just pointed out, they're not going to happen in a conversation. They might not yeah, even happen yeah. in a lifetime. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, uh, and I'm interested in your take on this, actually, if I could, like, turn the tables. One <laughs> of the places where where Steve and I have, I think, a fundamental disagreement, and it may not be that we disagree, it may just be that we frame the question differently, is we often talk about, you know, I'm often asking, do you think this person really believes that they're psychic? Or do you think this person is just a pure con artist or mm. charlatan? Is it somewhere in between? And his answer is usually, I don't think it matters. Like, I don't think that's the right question. I think that for all intents and purposes, that's the same thing. And I don't believe that that's the case. I, I, maybe from like an outcome perspective of how they're affecting other people, it doesn't matter. But in terms of grappling with these core existential issues of what it means to be a believer mm. or what it means to be, you know, have the wool over your eyes or whatever, I think it really does matter if somebody is an overt charlatan and if you caught them, like, you know, what I think is like an Alex Jones situation, where if you actually were able to get him off guard, he'd be like, yeah, I'm just making money off this shit. Um, yeah, or yeah. A, an individual who's like, no, I really believe that I, I I have visions. Like, you can't take that away from me. I know it. And I've had all these anecdotal experiences that reinforce it. Um, to me, those that's two very different people. And you have to approach them very differently. What do you think yeah. about that? Because you talk to people like, this all the time of what you do. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, and I think to be honest, the, the vast majority of people that I that I talk to, and the more time I spend talking with people in, the, in these kind of spaces, the more I think the number of charlatans is actually way way smaller than we'd like to believe. Um, and, and I and I say it's smaller than we'd like to believe because it's very easy to say to think um, this harm was done, as I was saying before, this harm was done by this person because they're evil, because they're exploiting people. When I think a lot of people can do a huge amount of harm and exploit people and know they're exploiting people, but still believe that what they're doing is genuine, and it gets very, very muddy in between. But I think, It is muddy, yeah. yeah. I think the tactics that you would, that you use when you're engaging with people would do differ um, if 
the person knows that they are lying, uh, I think. And it's incredibly difficult to get to point. If in, in the hypothetical, we could say this person over here, we've caught them bang to rights. They absolutely know they're lying. I think the tactics that you'd use would differ. Um, but I don't think the amount of harm necessarily differs. And I, and I interviewed um, Jim Humble, who invented Miracle Mineral Supplement. And during the course of the conversation, he was talking about 50,000 people who had cancer, he's given it to 70,000 people with malaria, 80,000 people with AIDS, just the numbers absolutely racking up into the hundreds of thousands of people that he that have deadly diseases, that he's given something to, uh, to give them something that isn't going to help them and maybe only will, will harm them. Um, and I think I think when you're in those positions, the the people who are dead as a result of him, and there is almost certainly thousands, if his numbers are right, thousands of people dead as a result of him, they don't care whether they died because he was genuine or because uh, right. he was conning them. You know, the blood's on his hands regardless in that in that way. Um, and I think that's why it's so important that we that we as skeptics are there to try and push back against uh, against uh, these ideas. But I think the the way that we do that does differ on on uh, what people believe uh, i'm just aware of the time so I, I do know we have to go for a, a break very shortly oh sure um, um but I, I think if we if we wrap it up there and i know we've got questions in in the second half so i think we're gonna have a 15 minute break for everyone to uh, stretch their legs to uh, go back to the bar uh, if you have a bar in your house feel free to go there and get yourself a, a drink um we'll be back uh, you can ask your questions at slido uh, forward slash nerdy you can see the link on the screen you can make a donation if you like what we're doing and want more of this stuff to carry on uh, you can make a donation uh, PayPal or, uh, or, sign, or sign up on uh, Amazon Prime. Um, we'll be back at uh, 10 past 8 for uh, all of your questions for Cara Santa Maria. So uh, I hope you're all uh, back to join us then. Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope you're all uh, rested. I hope you're all refreshed, and I hope you're all ready for a what promises to be a really fascinating Q and A. Uh, I'd like you all to welcome back to the stream our guest for this evening, Cara Santa Maria. Uh, so everybody, go crazy in the chat that I can't currently see. I'm sure you're all showing as much appreciation and love uh, as anybody could possibly imagine. Uh, so let's jump straight into uh, the questions here for Cara. Um, uh, so, Cara, we've got a question from uh, Skeptical Gumby in Oxford, uh, who asks, uh, what was the last thing that made you change your mind and made you go, oh, wow? Oh, God, put me on the spot with that. I mean, I think that happens all the time. I, I Honestly, I feel like there's not a day that goes by, especially during lockdown, because I've been reading, just like digging and digging and reading. And, um, and every book that I've read recently, because I'm a sucker for nonfiction, I really need to start reading more fiction. I know it would be like better for my mental health. Um, I read the, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, which really takes a hard look at mass incarceration and it's like racist roots in the US. Um, right now I'm reading Angela Saney's uh, newer book, um, uh, Superior. I already Fury, read yeah. Inferior. Um, I read a lot of books about death and dying. Um, and I'm trying to think of all the last, probably I've read like six books since I started on lockdown. And, you know, each chapter I read almost makes me go, oh, I didn't, not just like I didn't know that, but also sometimes, but I thought it was the, this other way. So um, it's hard to point to, I don't know if I've had any seismic shifts lately in terms of like my whole worldview is shattered um but definitely i feel like every day there's a little something that i learn about like american history where i might be like oh not surprised but gosh i wish it weren't that way or mm. i kind of thought it was this other way but i guess that's not true it also happens all the time on sgu all the time i yeah, mean that's what yeah. science or fiction is about too <laughs> right is you're like no it's gotta be uh, i'm wrong <laughs> i'm always wrong <laughs> Uh, we've got a question here from uh, Dave the Drummer, uh, who asks, um, what do you suggest we do if we encounter another skeptic making or supporting racist remarks or positions? What do we do about that, do you think? Denigrated on the spot. Like for me, it's like you need to come out and denounce it. And, and do it publicly. Um, mm. I feel very strongly, and this is um, not just based on my personal and emotional experiences in the world and, you know, my diverse friends, but also my academic pursuits. You know, you mentioned earlier that my PhD is in clinical psych. I'm existentially oriented in my therapeutic approach, but I'm also concentrating in social justice and diversity. So I take a lot of courses in, in this area and I read a lot of literature. Um, 
it, it, we cannot just be non-racist. Being non-racist um, really uh, still allows for passive progression of racist systems. Mm. Um, we have to be actively anti-racist. I think Beverly Tatum, who wrote "Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together at the in the Cafeteria," she's a, a an American psychologist. She mentioned very well she talks about the moving sidewalk at the airport you know like the the flat escalator thing um, yeah yeah and she, she talks about how you know the racist like the overt tip of the iceberg obviously race obvious racists are running on the thing so they're moving in the same direction but they're going really fast a lot of us are just standing still but we're still going in that same direction um and you don't even have to be racist to do that you just have to be you have to equivocate or you have to be passive or as martin luther king and i'm butchering it said you know he's not as worried about the klansmen the overt klansmen he's worried about the people who are looking the other way Mm -hmm. um and so and and beverly tatum says to be actively anti-racist is to turn around and walk the other direction fast enough that you're moving against the stream and i think it's it's our responsibility to do that if we see racism especially within our own communities we especially as white people have to be the allies and the advocates to speak up to squash it and say i will not tolerate this this is not okay within our ranks um you're giving us a bad name Mm-hmm. I think that's, yeah. that, that's I, I, I totally concur with that. It's uh, what we don't want is for for people with racist views to think that we are bedfellows of theirs, to think that they've got sympathy in our in our community, or think that our community is accepting to that. Whether those are overt racism or the more implicit racism that we see as people write off the Black Lives Matter movement as being not that big a deal, as it's such a small issue, should we even care about it? Those right. types of positions. Those people, uh, and and really, we're community. complicit by association if we allow that kind of rhetoric to um to utilize a sort of like skeptic label or to say it within a conference or within a, an area where um it it should be condemned um mm. you know i think one of the rallying cries that we're seeing a lot at these protests is silence is violence and i think uh, there's a lot to be said about that yeah and so, and so this is a question that isn't quite related, but maybe shares a couple of themes, which is um, that skeptics who disagree, this comes from an anonymous questioner, skeptics mm-hmm. who disagree over politics should put their differences aside and focus on the things that they have in common. How much do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a difference between politics and and civil rights. I think there's a difference between politics and and basic social justice. And that's a distinction that I think is important to make. You know, when I've been speaking up lately on the Skeptics Guide, and it's been a difficult thing, um, uh, our our editorial policy on SGU is that we don't talk about politics. Well, I shouldn't say that. Our editorial policy is that we are bipartisan, that Mm. we don't um, overtly condone a certain political persuasion. Um, But of course, that is breached and it's okay that that's breached when a certain political persuasion is antithetical to skeptic you know ideas so when you see a conversation about climate change being a hoax it, it, on a political uh, platform we're going to denounce that right like it doesn't mean that we're saying all republicans are horrible it means that we're saying in this situation this is not okay um and i think when it comes to these conversations around black lives matter the idea that they are political conversations Mm. is to me so insulting. You know, the idea that this could be minimized and to, and have, you know, some sort of intellectual debate about whether or not citizens of our country deserve equal rights, uh, whether about, intellectual debates about whether or not racism exists. I mean, it blows my mind. This is not a political problem. So although I agree that, yes, a lot of uh, skeptics should be able to have uh, respectful and intelligent conversations regardless of the side of the aisle that they're on. Uh, I don't think that's the case if you're on the wrong side of history. Mm. I don't think that's the case if you are um, uh, somebody who does not care or is a directly um, uh, uh, anti-social justice. And um, sadly, there are skeptics within our ranks who are like who would call me a social justice warrior and think that that's a pejorative phrase, <laughs> um, you know. And so, uh, t- 
to me, that's not okay. Like, I'm mm. never going to just be like, oh, respectfully, I disagree. <laughs> like, no, dude, we need to have this conversation because we're talking about human life. Yeah, and I guess it depends on which element of politics we're talking about. I mean, if we're saying, uh, can skeptics who disagree about what the standard rate of business tax should be, uh, mm. can they work together? Yes, if it's skeptics who disagree about whether women should have rights uh, when it comes to reproductive uh, autonomy, <laughs> yeah. that's a very different, uh, different exactly. case. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I, I still think that you can have respectful debate and conversation about things like reproductive rights it, when they're nuanced, right? Like mm. maybe you disagree with certain types of abortion um, laws versus other types. But if you're basically like women are chattel and they should do whatever <laughs> their husbands say and they should not have autonomy, it's like, no, that's not a political persuasion. That's bigotry. Mm -hmm. Um, and a question, uh, I guess, to uh, a question that uh, completes the trio of uh, similar sort of themes. Um, are there any causes or people that you regret supporting? Right. So I think it's interesting. Regret is a, an interesting conversation. I have a million regrets in my life, and I don't trust people who say they don't regret anything. <laughs> um, there, of course, I've always learned from every, hopefully I've learned from most of the mistakes I've made, and the ones that we grapple with deeply, I think, are the ones that uh, that affect us the most. Of, of, again, my existential orientation is that suffering is something we shouldn't avoid. It's something we should learn from and approach, and, and you know, it's the dark things and the difficulties that make us who we are. Um, I think that, you know, I have had relationships in the past with individuals. I have interviewed individuals in the past on my show. Um, one thing that I think is important is that just because you converse with somebody does not mean that you condone every aspect of, of their belief structure. Even just because you date somebody doesn't mean that you're implicitly or explicitly condoning everything about them. If, mm. if, if we could only date people that we perfectly agreed with about everything, um, that would be a pretty small pool, right? And also, I think there's a conversation to be had about, again, checking one's privilege. So I was invited a while back to do this, like, pangburn philosophy debate, which it turns out later on, I realized that, like, every single person on the ticket was, like, a horrible... Um, uh, kind of like alt right leaning mm. uh, libertarian, and I didn't know it. It was like a very Jordan Peterson kind of situation, yeah, yeah. Um, and I didn't know it when they first invited me. And I was grappling with: Do I drop out? When do I drop out? How do I do this? And I was starting to get a lot of like blowback from people, um, especially within the skeptic. How could you share a stage with these people? And blah blah blah. And um, and a lot of people really were like, "Hey, it's your responsibility, Kara. It's your responsibility as a public figure." to s denounce this or to say I'm not uh, you know gonna going to speak on these stages and blah 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 and although I do fully agree with that I agree with it I shouldn't say fully. I agree with it to an extent. When it's mm. my platform, that's a very different conversation than when I'm invited. And also, again, here's a conversation to be had about privilege. If I turned down, as a woman in science and skepticism, if I turned down every invitation because somebody was going to be present that was like a me too piece of shit, um, I would never make a dollar. And that's mm -hmm. the thing. Um, I'm not in a position always to do that because unfortunately the deck is stacked. And until the, you know, like there are certain times when I'm in a position of power and I want to use that power. And I think I try my best to do so. Um, I've made mistakes, of course, but there are other times when I'm not in the position of power. And my hope is that other individuals can be allies for me and that they can utilize their power and influence. And those are the kinds of conversations that are often had behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, but of course there are tons of people within the skeptic movement who not, not, not only have like turned out to be gross, but also there are people who have changed. Mm. Like, you know, we've got the Lawrence Krauses, we've got the, um, the Michael Shermers, we've got the um, uh, Richard Dawkins, who it's turned out, you know, whether it's turned out or we've always known it, that they had some, like, harbored some not-so-okay views. Mm. But there's also individuals like Dave Rubin, for example, who used to be a good friend of mine. Like, he is different now. Yeah. He was not the, this is not the person I knew. And so that kind of evolution, obviously I'm not responsible for that. Um, but I'm also not going to take down those previous conversations because I think they're important conversations. And sometimes having conversations with somebody who, um, who disagrees with you is important. And of course, sometimes it crosses into the world of platforming somebody who is, mm. um, uh, unethical and deeply immoral. And I don't want to be involved in doing that. So it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, 
complicated to say the least. I mean, I'm definitely on board with having conversations with people that you uh, disagree with right. uh, who, who may not be ethical. <laughs> so, yeah, you're preaching <laughs> to the choir there. Um, but I would ask, um, is there ever a responsibility that you feel, given your visibility and some of the projects you're involved in, uh, to um, uh, platform people? And, and does it depend uh, to, to you know, elevate certain voices? And does it depend at all on uh, the audience that you that you have in that particular platform or the medium? So, you know, Talk Nerdy being your own platform, the SGU, where it's a, a collaboration with a, a very sizable audience, something on TV where there's many more people in the room making the decisions. How do those uh, responsibilities kind of sit with you and, and where do they sit in terms of how you platform and, and elevate voices that you think need to be elevated? Right. It's really complicated because I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about like, how much am I empowered to do this? Right. My own show, um, long story short, like, I don't know if you know the origin story of my show, but when I was working on a television show on a now defunct network, um, where I was a co-host and even co-host with a, with a male co-host, um, we had an executive producer who was like probably the most misogynistic person I've ever met in my life. And, and I experienced the kind of deep gaslighting that that you only hear about in stories um, about Hollywood, like deep sexism, um, you know, basically telling me the staff doesn't like you. When you open your mouth, people cringe. You should really keep quiet. We don't want to hear your opinions. And really made, like the gaslighting was so deep that I started really questioning my value on the show. It was a dark time. I was, you know, working on it a lot in Jeez, therapy. Yeah. Yeah, it was hard. And that's around the same time when I actually went on Joe Rogan's podcast, interestingly, talking about <laughs> controversial and interesting characters. Um, and he, I had been on his show a couple of times. And this time he was like, offline, was like, Carrie, you should start a podcast. Like, you're your own producer. You can, you're uncensored. You say what you say. You don't have to answer to these assholes who are trying mm. to control you um and then of course on air he was like what do you think should she start a podcast reach out and i got flooded <laughs> with like thousands of really kind um comments and and of course he was my first guest and really did i think a, a really great thing and a sweet thing to to help me find that voice in that platform um and so you know there are situations like in television like you mentioned where it doesn't matter what i think mm. you know the only real power i have is to quit <laughs> if something gets too bad, I can walk, but really I can't, you know, control the narrative at all. So I'm going to push insofar as um, it doesn't threaten my job. Or if I feel like at a certain point it's not worth it anymore, then I will leave, right? Mm -hmm. And that has happened. Um, whereas Talk Nerdy is the complete other end of the spectrum. It's my show and I feel a strong obligation. And actually it's really difficult when... It's gotten to the point now where I don't reach out much to to um, guests. Mostly they're coming to me because I've been doing it for a long time. And I have an assistant who helps with this. Um, and I mostly get like science writers. They have a new mm. book. It comes across our desk. And it's frustrating when a book comes across my desk that's a really good book and the topics are really good. And it's like another white guy. And and there's a certain point where I go, okay, this book is good enough. And I think it's inter it, I want to have this conversation, so I'm going to do it. But I'm working with my assistant to say like, hey, we cannot have three white guys in a row on the show. Like, where can we slot this person in? We need to elevate, uh, you know, women's voices. We need to elevate the voices of people of color. And even mm -hmm. I'm ashamed to say, if you look through my catalog on Talk Nerdy, there are not nearly enough black and brown um, faces. And, and a lot of that is because I you know, part of it is because the culture of science is such that there's not nearly enough black and brown faces. But part of it is because probably I didn't do as much work as I could have done because I was resting on the fact that I'll just see which books come across my desk. Yeah, and yeah. Of course, they're going to be mostly by white guys. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a responsibility that I feel and that I sometimes feel like I'm, I'm uh, failing in. Um, but ultimately, yes, my, my, my show is 50% at least women. Um, I try really hard to elevate uh, uh, ethnic minority voices. And even when I am talking to white men, I, I really try to challenge um, the conversation with those kinds of topics. I just interviewed somebody about SETI. He wrote a book about the search mm. for extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. It'll be out in a few weeks on the show. And we had a big conversation about colonialism and if we meet you know are, are the sins of our past and the way that we approach anthropology really the way that we should be talking about what would happen if we do get the opportunity to yeah, talk yeah. about alien race you know like we need to be thinking about these things and making sure that indigenous people people of color are at have a seat at this table and SETI of course is dominantly white men <laughs> so 
hello, like yeah. we're just going to be bound to repeat the same mistakes. But I think that's an important point. It's a it's a good question, and it's one that I grapple with a lot. And of course, uh, I guess the best I can say is like I'm trying, and <laughs> I feel like I can always do better. Um, mm. But I'm also in some ways proud of some of the things I have done. Um, but yeah, I, I do want to do better for sure. Yeah. Great. Uh, we, we've got another question. I promise you all these questions aren't anonymous, but this one also happens to be an anonymous <laughs> question. Uh, who asked, um, why is Freud, why is uh, Sigmund Freud still so influential and still taken so seriously? Is there anything of lasting scientific value from his work? Yes. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of people are surprised about. So Freud really championed the idea of unconscious processing or, or subconscious processing. And, you know, we can parse some of the language there. But we know in psychology, you know, things like implicit biases, things like um, snap decisions that we make, yeah. things like inattentional blindness, a lot of these cognitive things that we understand about even about like the origins of racism and stuff. Um, these are things that Sigmund Freud really championed. Um, he was wrong about a lot of stuff. But you've also got to remember that when we talk about Freud, it's not really so much about Freud, but about the context of the origins of modern psychiatry. Um, and so Freud is an important person from a historical perspective, the same way that um, Newton or Galileo or Aristotle, you know, like there are people who we know were wrong about things, but their place in the history of that field is so important that their wrongness helped to secure somebody else's uh, pushing back against that wrongness and a new way of thinking. So yeah. we often talk about Freud and psychoanalysis because it really was the beginning. And then you saw a cognitive backlash to psychoanalytic views. And then you saw, um, uh, uh, or sorry, you saw behavioral backlash to psychoanalytic views with the Watsons and the Skinners of the world. And then you saw the cognitive backlash to that with the Aaron Becks of the world. And then you saw the third wave approaches, which is where I identify more with, um, with like Irvin Yalom and the existentialists and the feminist psychologists and, uh, uh, and sort of the constructivist psychologist. So all of these things, I think the history and systems of psychology are incredibly important for understanding what it is that we know now. Mm. Um, and also, I think for a lot of people, Freud is just a caricature. He's like, everybody <laughs> knows what he looks like. They know his name and he embodies like psychotherapy. But ultimately, nobody I shouldn't say nobody. Sometimes I speak in hyperbole. And <laughs> Very few people still practice classic psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. I actually have a professor who does at the Boston School. Um, uh, she's she's connected to the Harvard Psychiatry Department. And she has like psychoanalysis clients who come every day and lay on the couch, you know, facing away from it and do that multi-hour. And it's so funny when you ask like, who are these people? She's like rich white men. Like nobody else can <laughs> afford to do psychoanalysis. But of course, that's not what I do. I do, yeah. I do psychotherapy and, and I do a social justice oriented psychotherapy with marginalized clients and, you know, really trying to grapple with uh, conversations about identity and about death and about meaning and about um, uh, relationships and loneliness and, you know, some of these deep existential issues. Um, but of course, if I hadn't studied Freud, I wouldn't be informed about where the, how the field evolved. And I would be, I think I would not be as good at what I do. Yeah. And not I guess it's that, that, that idea of standing on the shoulders of giants works, whether the giants face in the right way or not, you know, you're still getting exactly. that kind of elevation. Yeah, like Freud was super sexist and Freud like gave his clients cocaine and Freud, but also like, it's like to some extent Freud was a product of his time. To some extent Freud was revolutionary and to some extent he was really, really wrong. But obviously that's history doesn't just like wake up and be woke. Mm. It, it like happens in fits and starts. And so we have to understand those fits and starts. Honestly, if you read any of the core philosophers who I read and really like have learned a lot from like most of them were kind of pieces of shit like a lot of them were like super racist yeah. very sexist like they just weren't on the right side of history with respect to those issues and again to some extent that's because that was the culture and that was the norm and to some extent it's because they weren't brave enough to go against the grain i mean i don't excuse racism from the past and say well everybody's racist it's like mm -hmm. no there were a fair amount of people who weren't racist you know who wasn't racist during the civil rights movement you know who wasn't racist during the slave trade black people yeah, yeah. but we don't really get to hear their side of the stories because we didn't write history from their perspective so we have to remember that in the conversation too sure yeah. um we have a question from somebody who has given us their name which is great uh this is uh Feugel, uh who asks uh what do you think are the dangers of adopting the skeptic uh label as an identity 
Mm, right. I think it's a personal choice. Uh, the dangers are that you're misunderstood. That's the biggest danger. Um, some people think that skeptic is equivalent with denialist. Some people don't really understand what skeptic means. I identify as a skeptic mostly because um, when I first started speaking my mind, I didn't know there was a community. I didn't know other people thought like me. I just, I had a platform and I did it. And then people would start to reach out. Hey, you want to talk at our thing? You you kind of sound like one of us. Um, and eventually I was like, hey, in some respects, I am like one of mm. you. Same thing with my atheist label. Um, I call myself an atheist, uh, but I know a lot of people are not comfortable with that. So they might call themselves a humanist or a or a secularist or a, a agnostic. To me, a lot of them are just uh, iterations on the same theme. I think agnosticism and atheism is basically the same thing. Yeah, like you're yeah. either a theistic agnostic or an atheistic agnostic. We're all agnostics. Nobody freaking knows. Um yeah. Right. But but again, some of that is just uh, semantic. Some of it is like a deep philosophical conversation where we can really get down to the nitty gritty. Um, but for me, the reason I call myself an atheist, let's use that as an example, is because atheists, by and large, at least in my country, um, are um, minimized, mm. uh, especially within government. So it's like it's a death way. You're not going to be elected president if you're an atheist. Like you can't say I don't go to church. Yeah, it's just yeah. our country has struggles with that, right? And so for me, it's it's like a again, it's a social justice move to wear the label because if I can show people through my actions that I'm uh, an upstanding citizen who cares about civil rights, who cares about um, civic duty, and who care, and, and I'm still an atheist and I don't have horns and I don't believe in Satan, <laughs> and you know, if I can break people's conceptions, and that's what I'm gonna do. I do the same thing with skepticism, but I'm not as like warriory about it. Mm. I just happened to work on a skeptic podcast. Yeah, yeah. But it's funny because one of the things the guy said to me when I first came on the show that they really liked about me and part of the reason they asked me to join them, and this comes up all the time because we'll be talking kind of politics behind the scenes and not American politics, like like skeptic group politics. Yeah. And they'll yeah. be like, oh, so-and-so did this thing. And I'm like, who is that again? <laughs> Tell me about the context. What is that? And they're like, we love this about you. You don't seem to know anything that's going on in the community. <laughs> And it's just, I haven't really concerned myself with that because it's not, it's not my world. I'm not really administration in the skeptic groups. Yeah, I have yeah. many other things to worry about and I don't really care, you know? So and, yeah, and I think I it's a it's personal that, choice. Yeah. And I guess it's that thing with the label that uh, if I don't call myself a skeptic, sorry, I, I call myself a skeptic because I think if I don't call myself a skeptic, there are plenty of people who are complete assholes who are calling themselves skeptics. And that's right. what people will think when they see skeptic. Whereas if I, I, if I think if I can be a compassionate skeptic who shows that skepticism is an act of compassion, it's, we're here to look after each other because there isn't anywhere else to, to go and we can all be, be so easily fooled. And when you're in your most vulnerable position, that's when you're most likely to be fooled. So we're there to kind of watch each other's backs. Um, if nothing else, when we talk to people we disagree with, if they have a conversation with someone like me who wants to try and be a nice, warm, fuzzy, friendly, <laughs> compassionate skeptic, they might think, well, I didn't agree with him, but he wasn't an arsehole. And I thought they were all arseholes. I thought they were all evil. Exactly. I thought they were all big pharma shills. He seemed all right. Maybe they're not as bad as uh, as I've been told. And I think we can reclaim it almost to, to have that positive sense by being positive people with it. Well, and we have to understand, too, in terms of um, institutions, right? Skepticism is a social movement more than anything. It's not an academic movement um, as much as we utilize a lot of academic understandings. But you're not going to necessarily see conversations about skepticism in philosophy classes. You're going to see the themes that we discuss, of course, mm. but they're going to have different labels and different terms. And so because of that, skepticism doesn't really have, I think, the strongest operational definition. And it's definitely not monolithic. The same way that like existentialism is not monolithic. Um, even existential therapy is not monolithic because you have secular existential therapists who teach um, and then you have uh, religious existential therapists who teach and they have different takes of similar concepts about meaning and things like that. I, I would point you to like Irvin Yalom and Viktor Frankl, right, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, who famously was at Auschwitz and like is very deeply religious, but they mm. come to similar conclusions, even though one approaches these things uh, from a secular pers perspective. So it's part of the problem with, with this conversation about the label of skepticism is that it means different things to different people. Yeah, and it's, yeah. there's no academic, like, we're living in history right now, so it's not really in the, the academic history books per se. Um, it's a little easier to identify as like, no, from a philosophical perspective, I'm a constructivist or I'm a logical positivist or I'm a whatever. Because they're sort of like 
academically accepted definitions of what those types of epistemologies are. So that's something mm-hmm. that I think is also a, a consideration. Yeah. Um, so I've got a, a couple of questions uh, about career t- trajectory. Uh, the right. first one is anonymous, uh, and it may uh, may even become apparent why. Uh, they ask, uh, <laughs> do you ever wonder in a sliding doors style what your life would have been like if you'd won American Idol? Uh, you can blame <laughs> Wikipedia because they, they hadn't found out that you'd auditioned until they saw on Wiki. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's hilarious i hadn't thought about that in ages so for a little background i was 16 <laughs> i had just started college i was a freshman in college um and or maybe i was 17 because i was at the university of north texas so it was a sophomore in college i was 17 um i was going to, uh and a friend of mine was like you should audition it's just in it's like here in texas it was season two i think um, and so I drove to Austin and camped out and did the whole process. And I actually got like four callbacks. Um, and so I got to the point where you audition in front of the TV judges and I was so nervous and I was like punk rock, I had bright red hair. And like, I was showing off my like rock and 17 year old body, like an abs, <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh, I'm hardcore. And everybody's like, we love your look. You look so different than people here. We hope you can sing. And then they were like, oh, she can sing. Um, and I think I was good, but not great. And I had zero TV experience and coward at the tv cameras and lights and i sang into a hairbrush and they did not think that was cute they thought it was weird (laughs) um and i didn't ultimately make it um to hollywood you know that step where you're going to hollywood um all and so um i I do think sometimes about what would have happened if i had like if I had a professional career in music versus a, pro- a professional career in psychom, um, I don't think I would be as well-rounded a person uh, because ultimately I don't know if I would have had the external driving forces to deeply study and read mm. the way that I do. So that bumps me out um, or it makes me happy that I went this route. <laughs> I also learning more about the contracts that a lot of these uh, idol participants faced and how much they were basically like owned by the TV show early on and beholden to the advertisers and things like that. I really think I lucked out that I didn't, because I was one step away. Mm-hmm. I made it through all the callbacks except the last one. Really? Right? So <laughs> if I had even made it on the show, even if I had been booted in the first episode, I would have had to sign all of those contracts. And now that I work in television and I understand TV contracts a little more and I understand you know, exclusivity clauses and, uh, you know, first position and right of refusal and all these things. Um, I'm actually really grateful that like basically as a child, yes, I was in college. Yes. I got started on that early, but I, 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 I believed myself an adult. I was not an adult, um, that I didn't get pulled into that because even though some people think, Oh, you'd be so famous and you're not necessarily a and B maybe for the wrong reasons and C maybe I wouldn't have been good at that world or that life. Mm -hmm. I think by the time I, I became comfortable in front of the TV cameras, I had lived a lot more. And now that I'm working on my PhD, I'm in my mid thirties. I'm better at it because I have the life experience. So, um, you know, I'm, my life is what it is. I can't rewrite it. And I do sometimes think about how different it would be, but it's such a departure. It's like, you know, when you hear about a a satellite that gets bumped off course and it's like the tiniest degree, but then it goes like this. (laughs) And at a certain point you're like, it's so far away. I, it's hard for me to fathom what that would have been like. I mean, but I, I've, I've had um, significant others in the past who are famous and who live certain types of lifestyles. Um, even, even, uh, musicians. And I see what touring does to somebody. It's hard. It's not easy, It's not easy to maintain relationships. It's not easy to maintain your mental health. Um, And in some ways, I think I'm lucky that I have kind of the best of both worlds. I have a platform. I get um, paid well, but not crazy well um, for the work (laughs) that I do in TV, which has allowed me to do things like own my own home. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. amazing. Um, But I also don't really get recognized on the street except once in a while. I definitely paparazzi don't care about. I don't have to deal with all the stuff of fame that some people have to deal with. So, whoo. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> Dodged a bullet then. Yeah. Uh, and we have a question from Neil uh, who asks, along a similar kind of vein, uh, what impact or uh, redirection or, or anything do you think joining the Skeptic's Guide had on the trajectory of your career? Did it uh, have any kind of redirecting at all or what impact do you think it had? I think it, um, how do I put this? I think it, it made it so that there's a certain time commitment that I have now in this Skeptic's movement that I didn't have before. Mm. So, you know, the expectation of the Skeptics Guide is that we do a weekly episode, which we do during lockdown. 
we've been doing a live stream every Friday, um, which is great because we're all home, but we're not going to be able to maintain that. We've started mm-hmm. doing these extravaganzas, which are these touring shows that are, you know, big. I mean, we had to temporarily shut them down, yeah, but we'll pick yeah. them back up when we can. Um, so it's multiple events a year. Um, it's a lot, right? And I did this before I decided to go back to school. And I can tell you, it's not easy. It's not easy trying to answer to like multiple causes. So it's like, oh, I got my clients, but then also my professors and my dissertation and oh and like talk nerdy is different because I can just do whatever the hell I want like mm. I have made it so it's low-hanging fruit for me like I love it I get to dive in and get deep in the conversation but everything beyond that one-on-one conversation I have with my guest is like handled I have an assistant <laughs> who books it and d- talks directly to publicists I have uh, an editor that I pay which means I don't really make much money on it but because I'm like you know, delegating everything, but it's the Mm. only way I could keep doing it is that I didn't spend more time on it. SGU takes time. Um, So one of the biggest ways it's influenced my life, yes, I think it's helped with the, with sort of a platform, but in a way it's like a yes and no thing because SGU is weird. It has a massive listenership, but that doesn't necessarily translate to an Instagram following, a Facebook following, a Twitter following. And also, I came into it with my own kind of following already. It's not like SU sort of like made me who I am within the community. Sure, um, yeah. But it has contributed to that. So for me, sadly, one of the things I have to do is I have to compartmentalize. I love these guys. They're like family. But SU is not my life mm. the same way that Talk Nerdy can't be my life. And even school, I mean, well, school actually takes precedence. And it, it, it works like this. If I'm working on a TV show, I'm legally obligated to put them in first priority. Yeah. That's what my contract says. It's also the way that I feed myself. So uh, when I'm working on a TV show, it has to take priority, which is why sometimes I have to take breaks from school for that because production's pretty exhausting. After that, my education is my second priority. Um, I don't know how long I'll be able to be on TV in like – TV years, I'm like ancient, I'm like elderly, <laughs> uh, which is so freaking sad. Yeah, Who knows yeah. how much, you know, it's like, oh, it's a whole political disgusting thing. Um, yeah. And, you know, I want to better myself. I, I can potentially have my own practice or I can work as a consultant. I'm not really sure what I want to do. I know I want to work with people who are terminally ill, but I don't really know exactly how, what that's going to look like. Um, but that's my second priority and goal beyond obviously uh, work-life balance, mental health. Mental health is my number one. If my yeah. mental health isn't in check, I can't do anything. So therapy, meds, all that, um, you know, interpersonal relationships, blah, blah, blah. Although sometimes they take a backseat, sadly. And my dog, he's my priority. Um, <laughs> I thought and we'd been interrupted like, by your dog by this point, but uh, you've been well, very been respectful sleeping. of the stream. I'm going to show you, actually, if you guys are okay with it. So he's <laughs> sleeping next to me in his little doggy bed this whole time. <laughs> He's just like doesn't care. He's an old yeah. man now. He He's doesn't care. Clearly, very unimpressed with the UK audience. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure when we say goodbye, I'll I'll pick him up so that you guys can see him up close because Killer's the best and he's literally the cutest. Um, so yeah, I have to rank order. I think skepticism is a big part of my milieu, and I love the SGU, and I'm so glad that the guys allow for me to do all the things that I do and understand. Like sometimes I'm not on the show. You guys have noticed that, mm. and it's just because I can't because I have a school thing or because my clients need me or because um my you know I'm filming that day for television and but also a lot of those things came first some of them came later trying to make sense of of a a fractioned uh, fractured that's the word um approach to my career that I kind of have to do it all to be able to get by and to allow myself the security for the future yeah. um because yeah I have a non-traditional job I don't have a boss <laughs> And awesome. oh, we've, got, we've got well, we've got a lot of questions left, but I think we've got time for like one or two more okay. of the ones that are that are highest. Uh, I'm gonna keep it short. On list here. I'm so um, bad at this. <laughs> no, it's it's absolutely fine. <laughs> uh, so another anonymous uh, questioner asked, uh, "What do you think made the nerdy movement go from a bullied subculture into being super cool as it seems to be these days?" I think a, a lot of times that's about the tenacity of the people in it. Really, I mean, I also think there's like a zeitgeist shift that's come along with being a, like a. a computer society a technologically advanced society a realization that like the nerds are the ones who make the world go around um and like there's like a sexiness that has come from that but i also think it's about flipping that on its head it's about nerds saying because the thing is right who defines history we've had this conversation already history is is defined by the people in power 
And so the bullied kind of like geeky whatever perspective of a nerd, which still persists, it persists in certain circles where people who don't get it and who don't care to get it, who aren't sensitive, um, are the ones in power who are defining the narrative. But when you find yourself in a position where you have a platform and where you can define the narrative and you self-identify as a nerd, um, then all of a sudden the global perspective of that starts to shift and this whole thing about being cool like it's cool to be nerdy it's okay to be smart um you know education is is something we should be proud of it's not something we should be ashamed of all those things um some of them are backlash of social pressures uh some of them are are just because the zeitgeist has shifted in that way in certain respects and some of it Mm. is because the people themselves have said i'm over this image this is yeah, not yeah. a positive image and it's not helping. Um, so I'm going to kind of take it and make it my own. Yeah. Well, I think we've got time for one more question and only plenty of time for this. And you probably know what's uh, what's coming. Uh, but thinking of the future in whatever oh, context is important to you at the moment, <laughs> family, work, your country, the world, even the universe. Firstly, what's the one thing that keeps you up at night? Uh, what are you concerned about, even pessimistic about? Uh, and on a lighter note, as uh, you know where I'm going with this, uh, what are you excited for? What are you optimistic about? And what are you looking forward to in the future? Right. I think my answer to this probably changes day to day. Um, You know, I think a lot of people I have on the show talk about climate change, and there's a good reason for that, because for many of us, it's really pressing. Um, uh, For all of us, it's really pressing. But I think there's something that's even more pressing than some of these big um, global concerns like climate change. The reason climate change is so scary is because we haven't been able to solve it. And the reason Mm -hmm. we haven't been able to solve it, I think, is because of tribal conflict. And and really that's the thing I'm most concerned about is humanity's ability to put petty differences aside, Mm -hmm. uh, to not elevate narcissists into positions of power, to listen to the voices of women and marginalized communities who might have nonviolent approaches and diplomatic approaches to solving problems. Um, You know, uh, some people listen to me and my feministic views and they might think that I'm like man hating or they might think that I'm like a feminazi. But ultimately I I really do grapple with these questions about like if women were in the situation room, if women were, were uh, at the table uh, when it came to making decisions about drone strikes or Mm. about uh, call, colonizing space even, Um, you know, I do think that we would have a different approach. And, um, and the same can be said about listening to indigenous voices, um, and listening to uh, voices of marginalized uh, individuals, the way we've been doing things for most of Western history is not good. Mm. This, this conquer, this colonize, uh, you know, get what I need, plunder, extract, and deal with the fallout later. And and also it's shaped our worldview that somehow we are a more evolved or we are a more progressive, you know, culture. Whereas indigenous cultures that have persisted for thousands of years, in some cases virtually unchanged, that that somehow means they're not progressive. Or maybe that means that what they're doing is working. (laughs) And then maybe like we could take some information there and and work together and so yeah i think the thing that keeps me up about is is deeper it's more existential and it's more human than s- policy issues or in or even something like black lives matter because all of these things are just uh examples of this core problem which is um that I don't think deep down people believe in equality. And I Mm. don't think deep down people believe that they're uh, not superior to other people. And that's a real, real problem that I think we really need to grapple with. Uh, Um, Maybe even it's a case of people are are not willing to give something up in order to get equality, in order for there to be equality. If they've got something themselves, it costs them something to do so. It absolutely costs them something. Um, Yeah, it puts them, putting themselves in a level playing field, it means you're giving something up. Also, Mm. there's a deep fear that runs through and it's exacerbated by uh, our media it's exacerbated by our our world leaders and it's much easier to be bigoted to be unwilling to be 
diplomatic, if you're afraid, if you look at everybody like they're a potential enemy mm-hmm. instead of looking at others, like there's somebody uh, from whom or a culture from whom we can learn. Um, and in order to learn, we have to be humble and understand that our perspective and our worldview is not like not only can it not be the only starting point, but it's not the standard by which we should always be comparing. Um, On the flip side of that, the thing that I'm looking forward to, I mean, it's hard. Like in my lifespan, I don't know. It's hard for me to not be cynical. I don't have kids, right? And I kind of don't plan on having kids. Mm. And part of that is because I don't know if I'd want to bring kids into this, honestly. Um, In, you know, sort of the the MLK view that like the um, the moral arc of history is long, but it's bending towards uh, justice. I mean, yes, I do think that it's maybe three steps forward, two steps back. You might've heard me say this on other shows. Some people like to think that it's two steps forward, three steps back. That's mm. not true. It Right now we're in a not great place. And so it's very <laughs> easy to be like, everything's horrible and it's never been good. We have been in good places before. We will be in better places. It's a slow burn. I wish we could do things faster. I wish that we could kind of evolve as human beings. Uh, it, it, it in terms of these more progressive views uh, a little bit faster. And now when I say progressive, I actually mean politically progressive. I don't mean um, technological progress yeah, or, yeah. or anything like that, how we would define progress. Um, I think that, you know, there's a, the cool thing about horrible things like pandemics and, and, uh, and horrible things like, you know, the police killing unarmed black boys and men is that, um, people gain perspective. The hope is that they they actually um, learn from that perspective. I wish it didn't, didn't have to happen this way. Mm. Um, but one of the things that I think has been a good thing that I've been noticing is that some people are slowing down and rethinking how they define progress or um, how they define what they think of as sort of the direction that their life should be going. And they're thinking about being more meditative and more mindful and breathing and spending more time contemplating and walking outside. And, you know, there's a lot of wisdom, I think, ancient wisdom, ancient Buddhist wisdom and Taoist wisdom and, and stuff that we can really take on and uh, realize that maybe the Western way of living hasn't always been really healthy. Mm. There are a lot of great things have come from it, but at what cost? Um, and that's something that we should be grappling with as a society. And so if I'm looking forward to anything, it's maybe that we can learn a little bit from some of these, um, from some of these problems and, and hopefully yeah. be, be better. Well, I think it's a, a great answer. And thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Um, if people want to check out your work or any projects you're working on at the moment, um, is there anything you want to tell them about or, or direct them towards? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'd say just Google me because even my website, which is my name.com, doesn't have everything on it. Um, I had to, to pare it down. There's just too much. But if you want to listen to Talk Nerdy, subscribe anywhere. You can subscribe to podcasts. Obviously, Skeptics, you probably already subscribed to that. Um uh, and then I did recently do a, um, a short series, a documentary series called Pulling the Thread, which was released by World Channel on YouTube. Um, and it's all about why people believe in conspiracy theories. So I recommend checking that out. It's um, I can't take credit for it, which is why it's easier for me to say it's quite good. Um, <laughs> I just read my line. Um, and... Brain Games, the last season of Brain Games is available on Disney Plus. Do you guys have Disney Plus in the UK? We do now, yeah. Yay! Okay, good. So I think you can check that show out now too, which is really cool. Um, So yeah, there's a lot. But I'd say, you know, if you want to keep in touch, Twitter is a great place. Insta to some extent, not Facebook. I mean, I have fans on Facebook, but I don't engage on it. I mostly just... (laughs) Facebook, I delete and ban. Um, So keep that in mind. Um, but Twitter's where I'm most active, and um, and yeah, the podcast. Um, look, look me up. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure any listeners, any, any of our viewers who weren't already subscribing to those things, uh, will go off and do so. But I'm sure they already were. <laughs> Cara, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I've really enjoyed this, and I'm sure the audience has too. A huge round of applause, every for uh, for Cara Santamaria in whatever virtual form of round of applause uh, we can do uh, there. 
Um, and uh, that is the end of our, uh, our talk, our interview for this evening. Uh, you can remember, you can come back next week uh, when we've got Antosini talking about uh, the return of race science and her book Superior, uh, which is going to be fascinating and obviously incredibly timely. Uh, the week after that, we've actually got uh, Natalia Pasternak, who is the uh, head of the uh, Institute for Questions of Science in Brazil, so the Brazilian Skeptical Organization. She's going to be talking all about what's happening in Brazil right now. And if you are watching the news at all, you'll know there's a lot happening in Brazil right now. So that's going to be a really fascinating talk as well. Uh, you can find all those details on our Twitter and our Facebook and here on the Twitch. And I'm sure the moderators are filling the chat with all of those links right now. Uh, if you want to give a little bit of money to support what we're doing, there's a link there to PayPal and you can sign up on uh, Amazon Prime as well. Uh, and other than that, I hope everybody stays safe. I hope you do too, Cara. And we will see everybody next time. <laughs>